program we have now um, be addressed by Robert's case, but the <coughs> doctor wouldn't let him come, so um, we could go directly to uh, the discussion, and I give the floor uh, to Dr. Artis uh, Zagatsistos, who will be chairing the discussion. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salberg. I hope you will be able also to make some comments during the discussion. And I think that all of us, well, can learn at least initially something from this. And I have learned one thing. One policy suggestion was time management. And it, I, I think it applies to our discussion today as well. We don't have to talk a lot about educational excellence in Latvia. We have to be effective in reaching the same vision. And if we accept that as a task for our discussion, I think that would be uh, time well spent. Um, I would like to first apologize on behalf of Dr. Robert Stilis, and it is um, a very Latvian story, good news and bad news. It's bad news for me as a moderator that Mr. Uh, Mr. Teals is not present here, but it's good news for me as his lifelong friend because it's the first time I've seen him listening to what doctors are telling. <laughs> and it is indeed good that he will be present with us tomorrow when the conference continues and he has promised to be and he will have the chance to listen to your excellent presentation as well. Uh, today, one thing as an introdu uh, introductory remark for our discussion, I would like to say that for a long time we in this country have thought about different, um, different uh, regions of study, for example education, as a very compartmentalized issue. And now at this table, we see how widespread the issue of education is, and I will just run through uh, mentioning a few interests that are represented at this table. Of course, we see here parliamentarians, thank you for coming. We see here people from the industry, thank you, from the Latvian Institute. We see this also as an issue of human rights, uh, as a European issue indeed, thank you for coming and we see it as an issue of national identity as well. So I would like to ask perhaps Nora Ixtena, our writer, who understands best how education and national identity collide and how education is connected. Perhaps you would like to share with us some initial thoughts about this. Uh, oh, happy to be here. Um, British author uh, Iris Murdoch says that uh, education does not mean that we are happy and free, but education uh, means that we can realize that we are happy and free. And uh, although I want to, uh, this small discussion to be a little um, like more about ideas, about visions, what we really want to uh, how we really want to see the educational system of Latvia. I, I want to respond to um, um, your speech because I think that one of the Latvia's bitter lessons that in the first um, years of crisis, um, um, uh, educational and cultural budgets uh, was attacked enormously. And I think this is this is lesson what we can learn from Finland that even we have this um, in Christ times, we need to invest in education and in culture. Uh, but uh, actually, it's a, it's a very, um, so to say, relaxing feeling to, to uh, talk about ideas, to talk about visions, because uh, uh, last three years we've been talking only about uh, budgets, about uh, economical stuff. And uh, what I see um, as a writer mm, discussing, meeting not only mm, school children very much, but also teachers, that I can point out two mm, serious problems in Latvian educational systems. The one is what you also sometimes mentioned, individual, because I really think that we need to think how strong in individuals we want to come out of our educational system. And the other thing is creativity, because uh, mm, uh, I was working a lot with the teachers of Latvian language and literature, and what I see is that they really 
don't have this time to be creative and somehow they oppressed uh, them under this uh, system, uh, system of teaching and they don't have um, creative ideas for to, uh, to spread up. This is for me the most, um, so to say, um, important goals, individual and creativity. And also I like very much that your idea about uh, education as a complex thing. I am um, being involved in cultural things, I really see that the um, educational, Ministry of Education and Ministry of Culture should work together, not work as a separate ministries. And then um, we really see very many um, similar things and things what to discuss between Ministry of Education and Ministry of Culture. And what I, I liked really very much of your speech is no homework, because I also have a niece. She's 16 years old, and I'm mm, always very... Mm, so I really did, don't know when she has a time for, I don't know, thinking, playing, relaxing, because when she went back from her school, she always had a double, uh, double work, uh, uh, which needs to be done at home. And uh, all these things are very, very um, um, important also for uh, Latvian educational system. Uh, although you, you told that uh, we, we don't need to learn directly from, from Finland and we are not so far from Finland, I should say that in some terms uh, your experience still sounds like a fairy tale compared to Latvia, but it doesn't mean that we, we cannot go Mm, very fast, in very fast steps. So that's my just uh, a short introduction yeah. of the discussion. And of course, there has to be a Latvian story. We can sort of see how it's built up in Finland, but we would have to learn our way to connect the dots and, 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 and pieces together. For the participants of, of this discussion, if you just identify, look at me, and I will see the, that you ha have an intention to speak, and I, I would gladly point to you. Yeah, Karin, please. <laughs> oh, I, I, I can say I, I can say one one small thing that the same way that Finns feel about the Swedish that you just need to be better than them, we feel about the Estonians. You see. <laughs> <coughs> uh, Madam Ambassador, Mr. President, Mr. Stalberg, uh, I had a genuine uh, feeling of happiness when I was listening to you. It was really like uh, visiting a, a fairy country. But um, I very much liked also how you started your, your um, uh, presentation by saying a lot of good words about Latvian teachers. This is also how I feel about our school system, that uh, in spite of uh, all the problems that are all the time raised by, by media, by everybody, and the politicians are trying to reform the system this way, that way, sometimes in very opposing directions with careers and, and pol political parties changing in the position. The teachers have somehow steadily uh, maintained the, the front line and, and they have always been there with the children and, and they have done their job and, and in a very good way. And this is very gratifying. But um, uh, my present position is that I'm now head of Latvian Institute. It's a small agency that sells Latvian rule. Uh, but I've also been in political positions. And what I was most interested in is um, how did you um, how, how did you come to it? How did you uh, manage to consolidate um, po political efforts, professional people? So. I understood from, from this, um, one of the slides showed where Finland was in the 70s and then only these lines started to go upwards. And I was wondering how did you project this uh, reform or process or, or, or the goal? When, by whom was this um, formulated that uh, equity is above uh, excellence? So we all we always strive for, for, for balance. <coughs> Was there a very clear definition of, of this in the 70s where you came to it gradually and, and how did you politically manage your, well, what's, what's, the, what's the medicine that you, you took on you? So thank you. 
Dr. Solberg, would you like to comment? Sure, yes, thank you very much for your, for your question. I think this is very important, and I must say that quite often asked question that how do we do this in Finland to get the political consensus and agreement on these things, uh, particularly when I travel in the United States, you can imagine how people want to know the secret of building a consensus. I, my reply often is that we, we have to, first of all, understand the political and cultural uh, situation of Finland in 1960s, when uh, uh, everything was very different and it was not very clear what the future of our country will be. And for the research of my book, I was, uh, I was reading some of the speeches made by the uh, members of the parliament and ministers in 1960s about the future of our country. And there was a very clear consensus across the, the political uh, lines in our parliament that knowledge and educated people is the only hope that we have. And remember, this was before Finland was in the OECD or EU or anything. We were in the shadow of Soviets um, and just a few years after the war and, and many other things. And it was simply a, a plain reality in Finland that we don't have oil, like uh, Mr. President said, well, and we don't have the privilege of advanced uh, industry like Sweden had. So the only thing we had is to educate our people. And there was no political disagreement on this. Um, and that's why the, the law that was passed in, in 1960s about having a common one school, public school for everybody, was the first step towards this idea that everybody needs to be educated in, in Finland. And then the other thing I, I would like to say here is that if there's anything that would be characterized as a, a Finnish way of doing things, I think it is this our ability to solve the problem and build a consensus. I, I don't know how Ambassador would explain <coughs> this. Uh, she's much more skillful in these things than I am. But I simply think that we have something in our culture and in, in the Finnish nature of when we are faced with the necessity and, and utmost importance, we simply put the politics and our own interest away and say that this is what we need to do. We may have different views on how we implement and how it will play out, but this dream that we created in early 1970s, 40 years ago, was very simple. It was like a Kennedy's, President Kennedy's dream to his scientists in the early 1960s. Remember when he said that I want to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And the reaction was, everybody said, Mr. President, impossible. We don't have money, technology, not, no, nobody has been on the moon before. But it was a dream, and in the July 1969 it was uh, fulfilled. Our dream was similar. Our dream was that we want to have a good public school with a good teacher for every child in Finland. And many people, many politicians say that, Mr. Minister, impossible. You can never have a system where everybody would learn and everybody would have a good conditions. It took about 25 to 30 years to fulfill this. Uh, so this is a kind of a, it's simple, there's nothing, nothing scientific there. It's just a very simple way of thinking about it. And thank you for inspiring us, both with your speech and with this comment. Uh, we uh, have, just, just one yes, comment, of course, uh, madam. Uh, regarding the consensus in Finland, uh, this is a question also always asked. Uh, in the 1990s, we had very bad recession in Finland. How did we come out of that? This is one of the things. But also on the the, the ICT, IT, high technology, everybody decided on the basis of consensus that we turn Finland to that direction. And it seems like a miracle. It turned. <laughs> <laughs> and if somebody asks, how is it possible that we had the whole political spec spectrum uh, in Finland, we have the, 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 the left and right and center and all that. Still, a couple of things that we have been able to, to decide together. Some people are criticizing that the consensus is this good in the long run, <coughs> that we need to have different views and, uh, and, and this and that, and we do have it. But luckily, we were able to, to do it in education and turning to the high technology. And with your kind assistance, perhaps, this is the chance for us to come together and start working on consensus as well. <laughs> Our next three uh, speakers, Mr. Piminos, Madam Steinbuka, and uh, Ms. Lolita Chiga. Eh? So, your comments, please. 
Thank you. Sir, my question is a very particular one. I may refer to the, to the stick uh, finish lesson uh, of the reform that you have just pursued in the country. So, teachers are professionals, as lawyers and physicians, as I told. So, what is an average salary of a Finnish teacher if compared to that of a lawyer and a physician in Finland? Can I take this? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, um, of course, teachers are earning on average less than doctors or lawyers. Ten percent. Um, it's difficult to say because, as here, most of the lawyers, if you're a lawyer, you're mostly working in the private sector, and in private sector, salaries, earnings are much different. But if we take the lawyer who is um, working in a, in a public office, for example, in the Ministry of Government, and a secondary school teacher, their earnings are not significantly different. If you, if you take the, the medical doctor who is like working in a public clinic in Finland and the, the high school teacher, their earnings are not significantly different. We cannot really compare taking the average earnings of the lawyers and the teachers. It doesn't make too much sense to compare this. But I, I think it's fair to say that teachers are not earning the same as lawyers or doctors or many other professionals. Uh, but if we compare the, in terms of the employer, then we are much closer to this uh, equal uh, similar salaries. Thank you. And I, I hope that we will be turning towards visions and how we see the future instead of talking about uh, such things as salaries, because one of the lessons from the Finnish side was also that not always money matters or investment matters, but the quality of teaching matters, and that perhaps we might keep in mind as one of our uh, goals for the future. But Madam Steinmucke, you and your European uh, sort of view, how do you see this? Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, Dr. Selber, distinguished uh, uh, participants. At the outset, I would like to say that I was actually uh, evidence. I have evidence that the recession in Finland. Why? Because I, in exactly in '93, I used to be uh, working uh, for six months in Helsinki, in the Bank of, Bank of Finland, As, and being an economist by my profile, I really was very interested in the recession and how. Uh, Finnish government uh, was uh, trying to uh, to tackle this issue. Uh, I must say, by also my own experience, that Finns are very good not only in uh, basic education but also in coaching and retraining <laughs> people like me, which had already the highest possible education and different degrees. Uh, but uh, in the transition, it was extremely important. Now, um, uh, I, I would like uh, actually to focus on three uh, on three points uh, from the European angle. Uh, and my first is about growth. My second point is about human capital, and my third point is the quality of life. And then I, uh, on growth, you know this. Uh, uh, fiscal austerity measures and fiscal consolidation compact. This is a visible part of the European strategy. What remains behind the uh, stage? It is a very clear message about growth. Growth and jobs, because this is the future of Europe. Without growth, everything is impo impossible. What is a strong uh, reason behind the growth is competitiveness. Competitiveness is not only about low salaries. Competitiveness is also about the quality of uh, experts, but also the quality of people uh, which are uh, working on the labor market. So competitiveness is strongly linked to innovation. In innovation, in turn, is part of innovation research education triangle. So, and education and higher education is impossible. There is no basis if the basic education is uh, staying behind. Well, uh, the Latvian situation is not as bad as we have uh, seen, but there is always, uh, of course, space for improvement. Okay, my second point is the human capital. 
people are going out of Latvia, especially the young people. And our human capital is our treasury. Uh, me, Mr. President, very rightly noticed that Latvia doesn't have oil or another uh, natural resources. They are very limited. So we have been, uh, Latvians should be able to keep this human capital and basic education is again is the right uh, ground to, to keep people uh, live in this country and work in this country. <coughs> and my third point is about the quality of life. Sometimes we, uh, there are some sort of stereotypes that people in the United States or I don't know are living better because GDP per capita is higher than in Europe. Is it true or not? Uh, actually, not really, because the quality of life is not only the income per capita. Quality of life is also accessibility to quality of health services, of police services, and also about education. Okay, so accessibility and uh, quality of education in Europe, this really matters in evaluating, assessing the quality of life. And that's why if Latvia wants to keep its competitive advantage against the other countries, against Estonia as well. So <laughs> Latvia should really invest in education now without waiting for the future when budget will be finally totally under control. Now, I think that if, as Madam Ambassador said, there is a dream, there should be also means uh, to make this dream come true. And this is not only really dream as a dream, it's clearly willingness of a political elite. It's really willingness and commitment to implement this dream. So Thank you. And it takes a member of European representation to show us that educational issues are above party competition, above issues of budgetary nature, that indeed it is something that must unite us in, in, in common vision of education. Thank you. Uh, Lolita, please. Um, yes. Uh, Madam Ambassador, you <coughs> very nicely uh, put it when you said, we turned and then it turned. <laughs> it's really uh, so beautifully put uh, as regards to that policies work. And uh, this is very important thing that we need to remember. And of course, uh, here in Latvia, for us, uh, 25 years of your educational reform sound like a very long time. Uh, because um, our country has constantly been going through all kinds of disasters and and turbulences and, uh, and historically we haven't uh, really been able to develop that very long-term vision. Uh, but of course it's very important to always remember that there is no re reform that can be started too late. It's always a good time to start a reform. And um, for that matter I really think that Finland should be sharing your experience much more with the rest of the world. And you said that there was a question why Finland before 2000? But actually, I can share in, in a recent experience that there are still questions why Finland. I was um, a, a part of the Council of Europe plenary session just recently, and your president, Tari Hallinen, was visiting there. And I thought that it's very important that uh, uh, Madame Hallinen tells uh, the members of uh, Council of Europe of uh, your educational successes, educational reform successes. And when I asked the question about how did you succeed and what was the main thinking behind it, there were a lot of surprised eyes that turned to my side and were asking why Finland, why, why education is so important. And I think that it's really, you put it very nicely and also Madame Holliman put it very nicely where you said that you don't have gold, you don't have oil, you have people and you have to invest in people. And in that regard we really have a lot to learn. But uh, thinking about the, this educational reform, uh, you already mentioned the importance of teachers. Of course, uh, there is a huge importance of children. But also you talked about the question about the general attitude of the society towards teaching and teachers' profession. Mm -hmm. And here I see that actually uh, we have one peculiar entrenched problem in that respect, which comes from actually the Soviet times, that parents don't have a healthy relationship with teachers of their children. 
uh, they are partly afraid, uh, partly timid to address the teachers because they have a childhood trauma from the Soviet times where teachers were the, the beasts uh, of the school and so on and so forth. So the cooperation doesn't go very smoothly. And that brings uh, the next, uh, next question about the respect, whether it's a respected profession or not. And I think all, uh, all of us who are parents, we love a particular teacher of our children. We really love, respect, and support them. But generally, as a profession, it's not well regarded because of that past uh, trauma partly. So my question is whether Finland did have some policies in this respect to change the attitude of parents and that would change the attitude of society in general, because obviously most of, of, of society members are parents in one way or another. Dr. Sober? Yes, thank you. Very important question. I, uh, I think in my society, in my country, teachers have always been traditionally appreciated and respected. My, my father was a school, primary school teacher and uh, Many of his uh, grandparents uh, were teachers as well, and um, I think to be a teacher has historically always been something uh, something important. But I think we had a moment somewhere in 19, probably 1970s and 80s when we had a kind of a dip in this type of respect, social respect on teachers, that luckily started to quickly turn to better because we upgraded teaching profession into master's degree and research master's degree level profession early on. This was in the late 1970s. And as soon as we started to have these master's holders in our primary schools and uh, secondary schools, it quickly changed the situation into better. Simply because we had, a, from the very early on, a, a very tough competition into teacher education. A very bright people went there and it changed the, changed the whole thing. I think we probably wouldn't have this meeting here this afternoon if, we, if Finland hadn't decided to do this very important move to upgrade teaching qualification to a master's degree uh, program. And I want to make sure that you understand when I say the master's degree, it means that primary school te teacher teachers have to have a research-based master's degree in our academic universities before they can teach a day in a school. And there's a difference, as you know, between research-based master's degree and a master's degree. There are many countries that require primary school teachers to have a master's degree, but it can be, in, in most cases, it's a kind of an administrative ma master's or professional master's. But in Finland, every single primary school teacher he will be trained in our universities to be a researcher. And that's what makes a big difference. And that's what has been also turning this, uh, this social um, confidence and respect to better. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Solberg, for this reply. There is another very Latvian thing. We are sitting all around this table, decision makers in Latvian society, and we have media around you, but we are using you as a mediator to tell each other what's important <laughs> about education. So thank you very much for being a mediator as well in this kind of discussion. And, and, and after that, you. Mr. President, Mr. <coughs> Ambassador, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to express uh, thanks uh, to Mr. Salberg about your presentation. And I want to say, as a teacher, my first education uh, was uh, education of teacher, as a teacher of Latin language and literature in minority schools. Uh, and um, I saw in your uh, presentation one very uh, important, many important facts, but one fact uh, touched me very much when you told that the person six times tried to become a teacher. Seven times. Seven. Oh, even seven times. <laughs> and uh, I see that uh, this fact is the most important in Latvia. Second is fact of salary, uh, because in Latvia, teacher salary is very low. And mostly, uh, there's a reason why mostly uh, women are <coughs> teachers, not men. But men are very welcome in schools, as we know. 
So, and uh, I think that uh, if we will change the mind of society, if we, if we, we will show that the uh, teacher is leader uh, of ideas and uh, that it is very prestigious profession, I think uh, the changes will come more faster. And uh, I want to say that I was also educator of teacher in the University of Latvia and I led, uh, led uh, several European projects in teacher education. So I can say uh, that the Latvia spent many efforts and also European Commission and uh, European Union developed many efforts uh, <coughs> to develop education system in, in the right uh, division, but uh, I think the question of uh, pre prestige of teacher profession and uh, also uh, salary are the most uh, aid questions and if we will solve them, uh, the things will happen more easily in, in the right division. Thank you. Um, I give comment now to Ms. Tairman, eh? and she is representative of yes. LDF 50, who organized this event. Mr. President, Madam Ambassador, and Dr. Selber, one of the issues that particularly concerns me within Latvia as I've visited various schools is the question of inequality of access to education. Uh, the inequality of access is actually within two <coughs> very specific <coughs> spheres, as I see it. One is actually purely a financial one, where there are so many families of very modest means and children find it very difficult to come to school with the right books, with the right equipment, uh, and also therefore in the background of the family, uh, there aren't the parents who are supportive enough to give children the impetus to work well. And the other side of the inequality of access, and therefore the denial to the same education that is in the mainstream part of education, is those children who have a particular handicap, whether it is a, a mental handicap or a physical handicap. And how is it possible in Finland to include all of these children of, who have very diverse needs and yet to allow them all to come to one inclusive school. Uh, it's a challenge, I think, here in Latvia. And I'm sure that the lessons that anyone can offer us here would be most welcome. Thank you. Now I give word to ESP Mamisi, a missing possible chairperson, uh, Dr. Ullin, yeah? Hello, everybody. Um, and thank, thank you for, for uh, actually for us being here today. I think we we haven't. This is a historic moment. I think in Latvia, especially from an educator, to see that many politicians and and, uh, and business people and Mr. President um, to really be <coughs> thinking so hardly about education, especially comprehensive education together. Uh, uh, very briefly about what we'd say, and then um, I would like to just illustrate, I think, where we are at uh, as compared to Finland and, and how we can potentially get there, but, uh, not very quickly at all, but uh, hopefully. Um, uh, what we do as an organization, being a non-governmental organization, we've decided to start somewhere, and in terms of really raising teacher quality, raising teacher prestige, and raising teacher professionalism, um, we've tried to invest, thanks to the corporate donors, um, into attracting absolute best young graduates into teaching and education sector in general. Um, what we're seeing is that no young people are really being attracted to this sector. And it's, so it's not just about teaching, it's about uh, administration, it's about decision making, it's, it's, just, it's actually even being interested in anything that has to do with education. So what we do every year is we uh, recruit, um, select, um, train, and support uh, for two years in schools, young graduates who have a bachelor's or master's degree in their area, and then they teach as full-time teachers in schools for two years. Um, they then become ambassadors of Mission Possible, and we support them as ambassadors to then very quickly accelerate into decision-making in key positions in society where they can start affecting education sector from both inside and outside. 
so that there would be um, mission possible school principals in a couple of years' time, there would be education decision makers, um, education um, district heads, um, politicians, um, you name it. People who can actually uh, um, affect the system on a national scale. Uh, what we have tried, and, and we can say from our uh, experience now of four years, that the idea of, of teacher quality, a very highly selective um, system, and then very intense um, training, it really works and it does give results. And I think we, we can um, see how can we scale up um, what we've learned within Mission Possible and also um, our better schools and, and higher education establishments. Um, that this, this is a model to, to really follow and scale up um, and, and use all of our efforts to do it. Um, we have very similar to Finland currently, our selection is 1 to 12. Um, so we have, um, over these four years, we've had more than 500 applicants apply to the program. We've had 54 teachers um, in the program so far. Um, and. Um, what we're seeing is that it is worth investing in attracting the best people and then investing in very intense um, education program for them, which requires a lot of uh, real-time support when teachers are already placed in schools. So that's another lesson. It's not just uh, enough to just put people out of a good education program, but for all teachers, first the new ones who, who just graduate, they need induction time in schools. They need to be supported there. They need to be working in a collaborative school culture um, in order for them to excel and be best teachers and not to leave the school. <coughs> so that's a lesson we've also learned, is that um, you can have very highly qualified teachers and good teacher support programs, but if they're placed in dysfunctional schools with poor leadership, um, with schools that are being beaten up by both politicians as well as parents and everybody else, teachers will burn out. Um, so th that's another uh, lesson we've learned is that we do need to invest in school capacity building and improving uh, collaborative school culture. I think uh, it's M Michael Fullan from a uh, Canadian um, education uh, reform expert um, talks about individual versus social capital. And, and I think there's a lot of research uh, now um, from uh, best education systems in the world in that um, if a teacher is working in a school where they have frequent professional conversations with other teachers, then um, they are much better teachers than if they are just high performers, individuals by themselves and don't receive any support in the school. Um, in order for us to um, go from where we're at or right now as a country, I think, to where Finland is. Um, I think we also have to realize what context we're coming from. Um, um, McKinsey and company put out a report um, last year, which was called How the World's Most Improved S uh, School Systems Keep Getting Better. Uh, in that report, they looked at 20 countries, Latvia and Finland were two of the 20 countries that were looked at. And what McKinsey and, uh, and company had done is they'd, they'd categorized the countries based on the current student achievement as well as various education policies um, and, and, and classified Latvia as a system that's moved from fair to good. So we should be happy, we've done a good job um, in terms of where we're at right now. Um, and our, our biggest improvement has been from 2000 to 2003, that's our big jump in PISA results. And I think we all can remember what happened in, in mid-90s, what we did in education reform in order to get there. We, we did introduce centralized examinations at that point, which was very important, not because we need test-driven education systems, and, and I totally agree with everything that Dr. Solberg said, but at that point it was important in order to <coughs> the attention of teachers that they need to start teaching to different education outcomes than they had been in, in the Soviet times. We put our education infrastructure in place. We did a lot of good things to lay the groundwork. In order for us to get to the system from good to great and from great to excellent, where Finland is, we need very different education policies than what we use so far. 
And those policies, as what McKinsey report shows, and I think a lot of the things that Dr. Salberg mentioned today, talk about schools that are free to um, decide professionally how they will teach the kids. We haven't decentralized our school system since independence. It's one of the sector sets that still run in a very central manner. Uh, we talk, it's both about funding, about curriculum, <coughs> about every aspect of bookkeeping. Schools are being centrally run. Teachers do not have, they do not enjoy professionalism. We do not have capacity building programs that will help schools become professional institutions. So I think these are things that we need to reconsider when we, we hear in public, let's mandate one textbook for everybody. <laughs> let's uh, forbid teachers to use workbooks. Let's, let's tell them how to teach. Let's tell them how many homework exercises they may give the kids. These are all things that will get us back to the fair system. It will never get us to great or excellent system. I think it's very important that as a society we understand what outcomes we're after and these cannot be uh, achieved by the same measures that got us where we are right now. And so I think this, the second thing that's very, very crucial is that um, I, I think that our, our current difference from, from Finland is that we probably need another 1993 in Finland. I'm hoping we don't get there, but we need a story. Not the crisis, though. Not the Korea. We have already. We, we do need a Latvian story for why do we want good schools for the kids, and and what these educational outcomes we're striving for are, and a uniform uniform idea about where are we going, uh, which includes an understanding that we are after uh, equitable education for the kids not equal as in let's give them all the same process well it doesn't matter that some get there some don't get there so i think there's a big difference between equal and equitable and i think we need to have a discussion about that in society so i think i think <coughs> if, if, we, if we understand where we're at um and and, and really decide we want to get there um and, and I, I might be very emotional and provocative here today so we really do care as a, as, a, as a program as well as you all care um because you're here um, that, that we do have very open debates about um, what our common goal is and also that unless we get schools to be highly professional decision makers about their work, um, we will never get to <coughs> high level education outcome for our kids. And obviously we have three great themes from today's discussion. One is equitable access to education decentralization and the quality of teaching. I think that's a result. But as the last comment, Eileen Egle, please. Okay, Mr. President, dear ambassadors, I'm really thankful for this opportunity uh, of being, uh, being here uh, in this debate. And uh, I just keep on wondering uh, sometimes uh, how much uh, uh, we are ready to change because uh, when I started uh, work in Strategic uh, Analysis Committee uh, in 2008, <coughs> that was the only time when I could uh, get an access to the World Bank research about reforms we have to make in our uh, educational system. And I could get, uh, uh, reading this material, only signing that I will keep it strictly confidential. So that was a uh, stamp put by the, by the government on reforms which were very, very necessary for that time. And nowadays I also think how, how deep the crisis should be so that uh, we are ready for change. And it looks like we are uh, not ready for long-term stagnation uh, and waiting, uh, so we are ready to change. And that's a very pro positive signal that I see right now. Uh, I, would, I would like just to pay attention to three main myths which we are uh, usually having here and which we, we, should, we really need to avoid. And uh, I really liked what uh, Zana was saying about uh, schools. So why do we need these schools? And understanding why do we need these schools would make us uh, also to choose better solutions and better decisions for investment in this sector. Because if we are looking at the amount of uh, money we have been investing edu in educational system, both from state budget, 
from municipal budget, from budgets of, uh, of the parents of the kids, and also from EU funding. I think this is a huge amount of money, but we have to realize that unfortunately we have not consensus about why do we need these schools. Uh, second myth would be probably a myth which has been created by the policy makers, uh, and that's a myth that we know the best how to govern the sector. And there is lack of listening. What do the teachers uh, are saying what the kids want, uh, what the parents are thinking about the future of their kids, and nevertheless what the labor market needs, what kind of skills do we need for la labor market for the future. So instead of uh, policy making, instead of decision making, there is much more need of coordination work to be done in a, in a, in a ministry of, of education. And that, that would be maybe uh, the way how to decrease this myth. And probably the third thing I would say that um, uh, there is also a need uh, to uh, educate and involve parents much more than we have been doing, doing that uh, than before. And there is usually myths that parents don't care, but I really, I really uh, know that parents care, and that's why those uh, boards of parents participating in, in the schools, uh, that, that's a very uh, necessary tradition which we would need to establish uh, for Latvia. So that's about myths. Yes, thank you. As a moderator, I would like to thank everybody who participated in discussion. I would like to thank everybody who listened to discussion. I would like to thank, thank everybody who will think about this discussion. And I would like to thank you for participating in, discussion, in this discussion in the future, because those things, that common vision that we need, and common vision, I suppose, is getting everybody looking in the same direction. We are looking at each other, but essentially we need to take a look at the, the same direction in terms of vision for education. And those three things that, brought, that were brought about in this discussion, equitable access, quality of teaching, and uh, this whole sense about education as being above um, our squabbles is quite important. And for concluding marks, remarks, I would like to invite His Excellency, our President, Mr. Bezic. Thank you very much for this presentation. This moment, for me, this presentation gave such good stuff for, for thinking. This was so complex, not giving precise answers, but uh, initiated us uh, to consider <laughs> where we are and what we have to do. Because there, no, there are no simple answers. And yeah, I was surprised about uh, Finland, about, about this progress. Uh, I tried to analyze uh, b b from 1960 until now, yeah, and I was surprised that uh, no, According to my analysis, uh, I got <coughs> such uh, impressions that in uh, uh, somewhere uh, between 16th and 17th here in Latvia we had better system. Maybe I, I'm wrong, but uh, I, I got something. <coughs> and then, uh, of course, uh, we uh, stayed of our development was not so fast and we found right track. Currently, I'm convinced that here in Latvia we have a perfect basis uh, to grow, no doubt. All different initiatives of uh, uh, our teachers uh, and schools uh, are enough self-independent to manage this process in a very good way, such is my, uh, uh, <laughs> my full, uh, I'm fully convinced about it. But about future, one such uh, so complex uh, point, and uh, maybe they uh, have some opinion. I have such a uh, strange feeling that uh, uh, children uh, age from, no, from three until seven, uh, 
they are already in a completely different world than we are thinking and uh, discussing today. Maybe I'm wrong, but I have such feel, and this feeling is uh, no, I try to exchange uh, the, uh, this my feel uh, in uh, the different countries. And here I got the same answers from three computer, internet, phone, uh, mobile phone. Actually, this uh, uh, new generation can very easily go to this parallel world, such is my, uh, my concern. <laughs> how do you see this uh, situation? Uh, how it is uh, uh, taken into account in uh, Finland? It seems for me it is the most uh, important uh, point for future education. Currently you have reached top, and this is uh, again one dangerous point, yeah, which direction, but uh, about this general uh, perception in society and, uh, and uh, this new generation coming uh, to school, this, this <coughs> seems completely different stuff and uh, not uh, I'm convinced that they will accept the same model what you have proposed, but, uh, which is still active in your country, and we, we try also to, to, to come closer to real needs. This, this uh, seems for me most serious, but thank you very much, and thank you for hosting this event here. I'm convinced that it's not the last one. <laughs> you were so active in different fields. Yeah, uh, we had perfect cooperation in uh, many projects, and this is, of course, most serious and most long term. Thank you. I hope that the discussion will continue yeah, later yeah, on. Yeah. But, Madam Ambassador, I have finished my duties as moderator. Yeah. Thank you so much. And you are all welcome upstairs. We can continue our discussions there because there are so many interesting themes that we can just elaborate. That was fantastic. Before uh, we all um, take part in the lovely reception you're offering us upstairs, on behalf of Mission Possible and Area 50, we would like to present you with a few spring blooms to thank you for being such a generous and welcoming host to yeah, our Thank you. I love the culture of flowers in Latvia. I think it's extremely civilized. <laughs> we have so much to learn from you in, the, in this respect. I mean, we have long way to go. <laughs>